Well, it's really my joy to be able to just jump in on this series on the book of Acts called Made and Marked. I hope that this has been enriching for you as much as it has been for me, whether you're watching online or here in this space, that you're reading along in the book of Acts, that you're engaging all of the tools that we have released for you online so that you can grow, including this equip class that we have coming up. So today I'm going to be talking about gathered for mission, empowered for service, empowered for service. See, in this series, we're talking about the birth of the church, the making and marking of the people of God through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. How many are grateful for the Holy Spirit? I'm so glad we are part of a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered church And it is in only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can represent heaven here on earth. Can you say amen to that? It's certainly not because of how good we are, how well we speak, and how hard we work. The only way that we can represent heaven anywhere we go is through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And we've seen how we are made and marked unto mission with power and boldness. And today I want to talk about the empowerment to serve. Go ahead and say serve. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we are in about Acts chapter 6, 7, and 8. I'm going to be focusing on Acts Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, and I'll touch on some of the other chapters, but that's going to be my focal point today, and I want to read it together. Is that all right if we, not together, I'm going to read it, you're going to follow, but it's kind of like together, right? A little bit. All right, but if you want to read out loud, I won't stop you however you want to do it. All right, Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 15. It's a little bit long, so stay with me. And it says this, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, say increasing, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit, say full of the Spirit, and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus. I practiced all of these names. Can you say amen to that? A proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued continued to increase, say increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. How many increase and multiplied are in this passage? Uh, The disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Verse 8, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit, say the spirit, with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the, out, the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of of an angel. Father, I pray a blessing on your word. I thank you that it is your word that transforms. It is your word that brings life. It's your word that makes us new. So give us ears, minds, and hearts ready to receive it so we would be transformed by it. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, would you say amen? 
Amen. There is so much in this passage, and I'm hoping to just be able to break it down in four small points. But one of the things I want to highlight is this is in the introduction of Stephen. Now, the church mostly knows Stephen as the first martyr of the Christian church, because that is a significant thing to be known by. And the word martyr simply means witness. Say witness. It is a witness, a full-bodied example of one whose life is fully surrendered to the things of God, regardless of what might come against us. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of stuff that comes against me and might come against you because we are followers of the way. But a fully surrendered life means that we die to ourselves and we live to Christ as empowered by the Spirit. But Stephen himself gave his whole life for the testimony of Jesus Christ. But I don't want to talk about Stephen in his martyrdom. I want to talk about Stephen in the witness that he had before he was a martyr. And that was as a servant of God. See, before he was a martyr, he was a witness by the way of service. He was the first appointed and anointed church deacon. How many have church traditions where you have deacons in the church? A lot of people do. We don't necessarily ordain in deacons, but we have all kinds of deacons. How many life group leaders do we have here? Raise your hands. How many coordinators of ministries do we have? Raise your hands. How many people lead our children's ministry? Raise your I could list all kinds of folks who are functioning in the role of a deacon because really deacon comes from the word diakonos, which simply means minister or servant. So if you are serving in any kind of way, I bless you as a deacon of the house. Right, Pastor Joe, I can do that. He's like, I don't care. It's yes, amen. So today, when I say the word minister, I want you to hear servant. And when I hear you hear the word servant, I want you to hear minister. Is that okay? We're going to use them interchangeably because that's how Acts chapter 6 uses it. Somebody who's a minister is a servant or one who serves, and one who serves is a minister. Oftentimes, we want to be like, I want, how many times you hear this? I want to be in ministry. And we think ministry means I get a microphone, I get a platform, I get an audience. But in Acts chapter 6, one who ministered, ministered at tables, ministered outside of the four walls of the church. And I wonder if we would have a long line of folks waiting to be in the ministry if they recognized that it meant to love the unlovable, to care for those who needed care. Today, I would pose that we are all called to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ as servants of the Most High God. Would you say amen to that? And so Stephen's witness started long before he gave his whole life for the gospel. It began by using his hands and his feet to serve the body of Christ. I know Pastor Melvin's like, this is my sermon. Amen. Amen. So there are four things that I want to highlight to kind of help us walk through this chapter because there's so much to it that I'm hoping you can take away with you. Are you ready? The first one is simply this. Ministry multiplication requires minister multiplication. Ministry multiplication requires minister multiplication. This chapter opens with simply this. And the disciples were increasing. The followers of Jesus were increasing. People were being added to the church. And everyone says, amen. But nobody says, what can I do to help? We want the church to increase, but for it to increase, ministers need to increase. And the church was feeling its very first growth pains because things were getting neglected. Not because the apostles didn't want to serve the body of Christ, but because 12 people can only do but so much. Can I hear amen to that? And when this need, the needs that were being unattended to as the church was growing came to the apostles, they didn't just say, well, we are ministering the word of God. Y'all figure it out because I'm in ministry. What they said is, whoa, 
We're not letting this happen. Because see, you know, in the ancient church, the people of the way, the followers of Jesus Christ, were known mostly because they served the least, the last, and the lost. If you wanted to know who followed Jesus, they were the ones who were taking in the strangers into their homes. They were the ones who were serving the sick and the leper that no one else would touch. They were the ones that were caring for the outcast when no one else would do. Before anyone heard a word about what they had to say, they saw that they were followers of Jesus by how they took care of others. Today, the invitation is the same. And so the apostles didn't just say, well, we're just preachers. I don't know what we're going to do. My guess is that they were also servants with their hands, but you can only do but so much by yourselves. So they said, gather up the church. Y'all, we need some help. Help us identify some of the best servants, the ministers that know how to serve. And the church rallied and they named seven people to help. See, here's the beautiful thing about church expansion. And when the Holy Spirit comes and sits on a church, when a church begins to grow, so do the gifts of the Spirit and the gifts of functions of the Spirit. And there is room for not just exhorters. There is room not just for the prophetic. There is room for givers. There is room for acts of mercy. There is room for those who have the gifts of service. There is room for everybody and the gifts you bring to the table. That's what the Holy Spirit makes room for as the church begins to grow. There is a place for everyone to minister. Can you hear an amen? Go ahead and put your hand on your heart and say this, I am in ministry. Go ahead. If you can serve, you're in ministry. And so the apostles quickly began to delegate the needs of those that were being missing. And I love that they didn't just say, go do the work. They actually called them together, anointed them, and laid hands on them. I think we should bring that back. Every time some, someone says, I'd like to volunteer for children's ministry, Pastor Melvin, Pastor Joel, everybody needs to whip out a bottle of anointing oil and say, I commission you and I anoint you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to be a minister in the space that you are because you are reflecting the power of the Holy Spirit so the apostles began to set things in order. Here's what I love about Jesus. See, we think Jesus is just the Prince of Peace. But when we meet Jesus, he's actually the great disruptor. Jesus disrupts things. Jesus takes things that were wrong and he breaks them up and makes them right. Jesus says we are part of an upside down kingdom. But the Holy Spirit is the one who brings order. The same spirit that hovered over the chaos in Genesis hovered over the early church and said, y'all are messing it up, but I'm going to come in here and I'm going to give you some deacons. I'm going to teach you how to bring order into the body of Christ so that nobody falls through the cracks. I hope your life has been disrupted by Jesus. Anybody been disrupted by Jesus? How many are you glad that he broke up the road in front of you when you were going in the wrong way and he said, this way may be narrow, but it's a whole lot smoother. Follow me and I will make you fisher of men. And then the Holy Spirit comes alongside you and says, now let me show you how to walk this out. He brings order in that which Jesus has stirred up. Don't say, Jesus, he stirred up a whole kind of mess. I like him that way. So the Holy Spirit was equipping the church to be able to be the church. Not just with words, but also with deeds. Remember James 1 and 27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit the orphans and the widows in their afflictions. And the church was being challenged in that way. Multiplication makes room for more opportunities to serve out of the capacity in which you are gifted. Today there is room for you. Secondly, multiplication of disciples means multiplication of ministers, but also the ministry of tables makes room for the ministry of the word. Ministry of tables makes room for ministry of the word. I like to say it this way, that the world will see what we do before they hear what we say. The world will take note of the things we are active in before they will hear the words come out of our mouth. 
So the ministry of tables makes room for the ministry of the word. Now, I want to make sure that we understand what it means by ministry of the tables. It wasn't that they needed someone to clean the tables, set the tables, put the tables down. Listen, y'all, when I was when I was a women's pastor for a bunch of years and working over at Kensville, I used to carry tables like this to all the things. I just walk around with a table. But I wasn't smart enough to get the lightweight tables and the plastic tables that fold over. No, I had to get the ones that were made of resin and cement and I would just pick them up because I thought I was somebody. I would walk around. I said, follow me like I follow Christ. Let's go set these tables up. And we did that partly because I wanted you to know, those who were following me to know, I, I'm not going to ask you to do something I'm not willing to do. And oftentimes that's what the ministry of tables allows us to do. But that is not what this means. The ministry of tables, the tables were known as a place where money was exchanged. It's where financial decisions were made. And the ministry of the tables was really um, people who knew how to appropriate the charity that was brought in to care for the widows and for those who had need. These were the logistics directors, the administrators, the one who understood how to put together the spreadsheets and to organize the volunteers and to be able to say, hey, this person needs a meal train. This person needs a visit to the hospital. This person needs just someone to sit with them this person needs a phone call tell them to show up at church on Sunday oh I'm sorry that that wasn't in the Bible that was just me talking about that these were all administrators they all this sounds like a Mother's Day message doesn't it because I feel like ladies ministers of the table right here so this was not just ministry of setting up tables and cleaning up tables but administrating the work of the ministry in the house of God see Ministry of tables makes room for ministry of the word in three ways. It makes room for those who preach the word, who minister the word. And I want to be clear. The ministry of the word is the same word as ministry of the tables. It's the service of the word, which means those who deliver the word are here to serve the body of Christ, not to lord it over them. Some people would say, well, this was the apostles saying, well, what we do is more important than the service of the table. And what I believe is that they were saying there are multiple services and we all need to engage in the one we're giving. It in. You ever have your computer open and you have a lot of tabs open? This is my whole life. Oh, I got a lot of tabs running in my head all day long. And my husband is my tech department. And oftentimes my laptop, I'll be working on my laptop and it'll start to get warm. And sometimes it actually gets hot. And I hear that little fan and I can't make it go away. So I call my husband and I say, tech department, can you tell me why my computer is both hot and there's a fan and nothing will open and I can't, and the little spinny thing of death starts to show up on the screen? I said, what is this? He said, um, when's the last time you shut down some of these tabs? I said, tabs, what tabs? Shut down what? I don't shut down stuff. He goes, when's the last time you shut down your computer? I don't do that because I'm scared. I'm going to lose something. I can't do that. He said, I mean, if you have all these tabs open, you think you're getting a lot done, but you're actually getting nothing done. It's better just to stay in one lane at a time. Your computer will run better. Oftentimes when we don't want to share the load with others, we got too many tabs open and we really aren't very effective. And the apostles were saying, we need to shut down some tabs so we can be more effective at the work, the ministry we been given to do will you help us so that you too can be effective in the ministry you do it wasn't one better than the other it was we need one another to minister effectively to the body of Christ maybe the Lord is inviting some of us to shut down some of our tabs and have others minister alongside of us in areas that we're not proficient in so it makes room for those who preach to be able to prepare to minister the word effectively. Secondly, it makes room for those who serve, who have the ministry of service, to model the truth of what is preached. Again, goes back to people will hear, will see the word before they will listen to the word. And third, the ministry of tables makes room in the hearts of those who are served because they've already experienced the love and the truth that they have been or about to hear. You know, yesterday we were part of a missions retreat and they told story after story of Muslims that were coming to know Jesus, but it took them a long time. 
One story was one man, it took him six months to finally say, six months, six years before he was, say, was willing to say, I want to know about this Jesus because what I've been doing has been watching you, follower of Jesus, for six years. And I have been waiting for you, I've been waiting for you to not serve, but you kept doing it. And because I've watched you, I now want to know what it means to follow Jesus. People will see before they will hear. It makes room. Ministry of Tables, listen, for those who feel like, uh, this is all I do. If you are ministering out of a place that God has called you, there is no all I do about it. Because see what I love in verse 7, when the ministries were collaborating together, the ministry of the word and the ministry of tables, it says in verse 7, Remember, the church was already growing. It says it began to grow even the more. The word of God increased. The number of disciples increased. And it said the priests began to come to faith. I turned it to be this way. The unexpected begun to happen. So when the ministries are happening in full effect, the ministry of service and the ministry of word, things begin to happen. Oh, church, would we pray that these seats would be filled, but would they not be filled before we have all stepped into the fullness of the ministry God has called us to do so that there's nobody who's left in the cracks? So how do, how do you know if you're qualified to be a minister? This is my next point. Ministry qualification begins with spirit-filled reputation. Ministry qualification begins with spirit-filled reputation. When the apostles gathered the church and said, hey, we need ministers of the table, ministers of logistics, ministers to help us serve, who are they? And the first thing they said is, let's get Stephen, who is one of good repute, good reputation. It's amazing that that was the first qualification, is that they had a good reputation in the community. It wasn't, what are your credentials? It was and who do you know? It wasn't who did you study in and how many levels of degrees have you received? No, it was, is your heart been transformed by the person of Jesus Christ? And it is, is it recognizable by those who are around you? Ministry qualification begins with spirit-filled reputation. And it's recognizable to those that you serve People that you serve, when you come to them with a spirit-filled reputation, they know it's not you. Something else is going on. Like, nobody loves me this way. Nobody has ever taken care of me this way. Nobody has ever asked questions about me this way. No one has ever wondered about my life this way. No one has ever wept with me. No one has ever rejoiced with me. What is it about you? That's what qualifies you to be a minister. It is recognized by the leadership around you. Pastor Dan often says it this way, that he'll choose elders and leaders not based on what they've done in the past, but how they pray in the prayer room at 6.30 in the morning. Because there is something about a surrendered life that is seen and heard in a place of prayer. Spirit-filled reputation. And of course, it's recognized by the congregation. I know I have told on a lot of y'all in the past, like, have you seen so-and-so to other leaders? Like, we need to call that person. Why? Because have you seen the way they love, the way they serve, the way they give, the way they do, the way they never stop smiling? That needs to be the next person who's leading X, Y, Z. Because there's a spirit-filled reputation that is recognizable to the congregation. And I love that all of the church of Acts, when they presented the seven to them, they were all pleased with it because they knew that the spirit abided in those ministers of the tables. Oh, would we all be recognized by our spirit-filled reputations no matter where you go? At your workplace, in your homes, in your communities. This is what qualifies us to be ministers. And finally, the ministry of service requires those in full service of the Spirit. You know, oftentimes we think it's the preachers who really need to be in prayer and anointed by the Holy Ghost, but all the other ministry services, well, you know, 
You just give him what you got. I believe Stephen was the exact example of the opposite of that reality. The ministry of service requires those in full service of the Spirit. Let me give you the descriptors that I read about in Acts chapter 6 that described Stephen. Not only was he of good repute, but he was full of the Spirit. Will you say full of the Spirit? Verse 3 said, and of wisdom. Verse 5 says he was a man full of faith and, guess what, of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 8, he says, he did great wonders and signs among the people and was full of grace and power, and I put in parentheses, in the Holy Spirit. This was a man called to serve tables, and he was walking full of the Spirit. No longer do we have excuses to say, well, all I do is work in the parking lot. All I do is greet people. I don't need to stop. The greatest witness of the church in those days was one who ministered at the tables. And he was full of the Spirit. Every ministry that we bring before the Lord requires the anointing and the fullness of the Spirit. As I bring this to a close, I simply have this challenge for each and every one of us. If you are one who is in ministry of tables, ministry to serve, and that should be every one of us, every one of us, I call you to lean into the things of the Spirit. Is it all right if I do a little bit of ministry right now? As the music plays and as we hear what the Lord is saying, we've just rehearsed the things that were revealed in Stephen because he was full of the Spirit. And I believe that those belong to the body of Christ at large. And today I just want to invite you. Today the Word of God says that Stephen was full of the Spirit and of wisdom. If you are in a situation or a circumstance where you need the Spirit of wisdom, to be full of the spirit of wisdom, would you simply raise your hand right now? I want to pray over you. You don't have to get up. You don't have to do anything magical. Just lift your hand. I want to pray for you. Father, right now, I thank you that these ministers of service, ministers of the word, ministers unto you, God, um, are calling upon you to be full of wisdom by your spirit. I pray, oh God, there would be a release of wisdom that would be supernatural insight that would be heavenly an understanding that would not come from man's mind but by the anointing of the holy spirit as your ministers lean in to you holy spirit god would they not lean on their own understanding but in all their ways acknowledge you and watch you do the things that they cannot do on their own I thank you and I bless them with the spirit of wisdom in Jesus' name. Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, but he was also full of faith. Today, if you need a new measure of faith to believe that God will do what he has promised you he would do, go ahead and raise your hand. Part of leaning into the Spirit is expecting that He will do that which He has said He would do. So, Father, right now, I pray, oh God, for... Uh, an increased measure of faith, faith for finances, faith for opportunities, faith for doors to open, faith to believe that you will do the impossible, faith for healing, faith for family, faith for prodigals, faith that would allow them to look at the face of danger with peace on their countenance. And we thank you that by your spirit, this is possible in Jesus' name. Stephen was a man full of faith, full of wisdom. And he was also a man full of grace. And by grace, it doesn't mean the grace of salvation. By grace, it meant the grace for endurance. I love your hands just dropped. She said, I want every bit of it. Hallelujah. I know. I got both mine up too. The grace for endurance. In chapter 7, Stephen preaches the most remarkable, one of the most remarkable sermons, salvation sermons ever known throughout the scripture. 
And he did that in the face of the greatest persecution. And that's because he was full of grace. Sometimes the persecution doesn't go away, just that the fruit of the Spirit begins to grow and show itself all the more. If you're in the face of something hard, but you want the grace to stand, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for endurance. I pray for the gift of grace to rest on your people online and in this room. I pray, oh God, that they would be like Stephen. They would be great witnesses in the face of hard times that they know Jesus and they are full of the Spirit and they will not waver even when it's challenging because there is a grace upon them to stand to be unmovable and unshakable because their feet are planted on the rock, not on their ideas, not on their reputation, not on their success, but their feet are planted on the one who has saved them, set them free and given them the promise of eternity. So I ask for a measure of grace to be released in the name of Jesus. And before I finish, I'm going to ask everybody to stand, and then I'm going to ask Pastor Melvin to come. I want to do one more prayer to everybody here. Not only did Stephen have wisdom and faith and grace, but it says that he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. That belongs to all of us when we accept Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is in us. This, listen, next week is Pentecost Sunday. Y'all better get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready. But see, we don't have to wait for a day. The Holy Spirit is ready to fill us at all times. His power is available. Would you just put your hands out? Because wisdom, faith, and grace cannot come without his power, without his infilling, without his indwelling. So, Father, right now, every hand that is open, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would hover, that you would release your power over each one who is in the hearing of my voice online or in this room those who feel isolated and unable I pray God that there would be a new measure of the power of your Holy Spirit made real to every heart and every mind and it would not just be a thought but it would be something experienced walked in and walked out that they would be witnesses ministers everywhere they go because of the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you and we say thank you for this. In Jesus' name, if you receive something today, would you say amen? Amen and amen.